you know, if you see your, your partner swiping on Tinder, like maybe it's a problem, but more about like, okay, so if I have a former boyfriend from high school who starts messaging me on Facebook and we start reminiscing, does that at any point cross the line, you know, and what is that line? Hey everyone, I'm Meredith Shirey. I'm a licensed psychotherapist specializing in relationship issues. And I'm Isaiah Vallejo Justi, a divorce attorney. This is a podcast about filling in the gaps of our relationships, the deeply personal choices we make for our families and ourselves, and the impact our actions have on the rest of our lives. This is Love Me or Leave Me. Hey everyone, welcome back. It's hard to believe this is already the 11th episode of Love Me or Leave Me, but here we are. And we're finishing up that mini series we were doing on sex, monogamy, and infidelity. We wanted to save infidelity for the last episode. That was intentionally done because we want to make a very, very clear divide. When we talked about monogamy and especially the idea of consensual non-monogamy, the emphasis there is on consent. When we're talking about infidelity, we're talking about what feels like a betrayal, where it feels like there was not consent and one person made a unilateral decision that affected both people in the relationship. So that's why we wanted it to be a separate episode. So Isaiah, I'm so curious about some of your thoughts. When you hear the word infidelity or affair, what comes to mind for you? You know, obviously the traditional definition is where one spouse or partner has had sex with another person outside of the relationship. And really this reminds me of kind of the conversation that we had about sex in episode nine, where the first question we kind of asked is, well, what is sex? Because, you know, when you ask the question, everybody thinks they know what it is, and then everybody has a different definition. Well, when it comes to infidelity or cheating or adultery or whatever you really want to call it, where's the line? How do people define this? why this has become so much more of a complex issue is because it is an ever-changing line and it's very very different for each specific person within each specific relationship and what the line used to be is very different than what it is now because 200 years ago emotional affairs weren't really a thing whereas today there are a million different ways that you could have an affair that might not ever actually involve physically contacting another person and people still feel equally betrayed you know i i see a lot of people come across my desk where, you know, there's strip clubs involved or lap dances or massages. And then you have people having debates as to whether or not that's cheating. And like you said, nowadays with quarantine, you have situations where that kind of physical contact has been taken away. And so you have non-physical contact. So you may have an emotional affair or texting or flirting. And then I hear people say sometimes that that's sometimes just as damaging as having a physical sexual relationship with somebody. For you and yourself, when you think about what would feel like a betrayal, right? What would make you question your relationship or that, you know, if your partner crossed X line, this would make you feel hurt and less trusting in them. And I think it's about just being really, really honest with yourself about what that is and talking to your partner, because it's very, very likely that you have different lines and that they're going to mean different things to you. And you're right. So emotional affairs, especially in this time of quarantine, have taken on a life of their own. And it's not just an emotional affair. Like if you're on a dating app, that's a fairly easy one, right? You know, if you see your, your partner swiping on Tinder, like maybe it's a problem, but more about like, okay, so if I have a former boyfriend from high school who starts messaging me on Facebook and we start reminiscing, does that at any point cross the line, you know? And what is that line? Where is it all of a sudden unhealthy because we all have people text us. We have people email us and call us and not everything is a betrayal or an unfaithful act. So how can the people out there know this is where it could really get concerning? Here's the thing. I think that it would be really, really easy to get lost in defining the content and setting parameters on this operational definition of what it is, what it isn't. And that's actually not helpful because again, we could have differing opinions on this. And instead of trying to arbitrate who gets to win and who doesn't, that doesn't actually get you the connection and the relationship that you're longing for. So what you have to do is to take the content. So the specific, again, what happened, what didn't happen out of it and focus more on the feeling, right? If I'm feeling betrayed, why is that? Where was the line for me? What is it that I want my partner to know? And so for the partner, the more important thing is instead of for you to justify or qualify the, the behavior itself, 
to listen to how your partner feels betrayed and to attend to that feeling. Uh, when people go into these things, you know, then all of a sudden they question the entirety of everything that's ever happened there. The way that we've defined an infidelity and also just the importance of what this means in our relationships has really changed and evolved over time. So when marriage was more of an economic arrangement versus a love match, it didn't matter. And it was actually very, very normal for you to have what would now be probably considered like an emotional affair. You were expected to have a lot of people in your life, right? So to quote a star Perel, what we used to get from a village, we now expect from one person. And so when marriage became more of a love match, what happens is we put so much more pressure on this person to fill everything. We want them to be our best friend, the best sex we've ever had, our, our career coach, you know, our partner for parenting and our Friday night movie buddy. So the point is, is that when we have put that onto one person and we expect all those things for one person, we've set the bar so high so that if they fail, if they fall out of it, we feel like it's no longer just a, okay, you cheated, but you've now created this crisis for me. Isn't that the idea of a Western marriage that you rely on one person for all those things? Yes and no. It depends a lot on your cultural context. It depends again on what your definition for marriage is. If you come from a collectivist culture, if you still live in a place where maybe marriages are arranged or your family is expected to have a huge degree of influence in making that decision for you. If someone was unfaithful, it might not be this devastating thing because you didn't do it based on this love match. And it's not to say that the love match is wrong because certainly in the West, we do this. If I was going to get married, I don't want to just do, well, okay, you're the only person on my block left. Like, all right, let's do it. Right? No, we don't want to do that. The question is, do we want our parents choosing our, our spouses, Meredith? Yes and no. It, it so depends. I mean, for me, it's a no. For me, I, I, I'm just <laughs> going to throw that out there. It's a no. No, thank you. I can figure that out. Mom and dad, I love you, but absolutely not. <laughs> but you know, it's an interesting thing though. So here's an interesting little tidbit on that. There's some research that suggests that more successful relationships come from when it was a match that a family member suggested. So again, like not going to take sides on that. But the point is, is that you do expect a lot from your partner, because when we're doing this as a love match, again, we're looking for our quote unquote soulmate. So if you put all this work into figuring out yourself and figuring out, you know, who I am in this life and what I want, and then I found this other person who is the counterpoint and the reflection of all these things that I built in myself, right? So you can see how that's a great thing. And when we find that it feels wonderful, the problem is we leave a very, very small margin for error when we do put all that pressure on one person in a relationship. The couple and specifically the person who feels betrayed, again, we're leaving that very, very open-ended about what that means, but the person who feels betrayed a lot of times experiences a lot of symptoms consistent with PTSD. So like the hypervigilance, right? The looking for clues, wanting to be the detective, wanting to look through every text, every email, giving your password to this, giving your password to that, and then being on the attack or wanting their partner to explain, right? And the other person having to really and honestly take a lot of heat during that time. I think at that point is usually when people have a discussion or at least an internal discussion as to whether they're going to leave or going to stay. Kind of like the title for our show, Love Me or Leave Me. And I guess the question really is, is like, what do people consider at that point? Is that even okay? Is, is it okay to, to think about staying? And, and what does that mean? That's exactly why we named this Love Me or Leave Me, because we're looking at both sides. And I want to say very clearly and unequivocally, there's not a right or wrong. There is no absolute. It very much depends on each person and each relationship and each situation. And so you are making the best decision you can for yourself based on the information that you have. And it's not going to be the same thing for every person. It's going to be very, very individualized. So there is not a right answer. It's not right to stay and it's also not right to leave. There are so many complex levels to what you have to consider because especially when you're in a relationship and so like for you and your wife, you guys have been married for a long time. You have two kids. You've got probably a lot of overlap with family and friends, right? You've got these very, very interconnected lives. And so depending on what happened, you have to really weigh the decision of is it worth unweaving all of that? And especially again, if our, if our relationship's overall good, the affair can either be the catalyst to the breakup, the beginning of the end, that last straw or it can be a new beginning. It depends on your specific situation. So if you're unhappy in a lot of other areas of the relationship and it's been falling apart for years, then yeah, even if you've been together for decades, finding out someone cheated might be the thing that says, you know what, now I'm done, right? Versus if we're overall in a very good, happy, healthy relationship where we still feel very, very connected, 
and this happens, it's not a good thing. You're going to be devastated and that's okay. But it's deciding, do we want to try to rebuild the trust to save all these other things about a relationship that work really well and that are very positive in our lives? And there's not a right or wrong answer there. It's just very, very dependent on your situation. The way that the U.S. looks at affairs we tend to be very shaming of people who stay. We tend to think, okay, well, if this person cheated, what are you doing? Why are you staying? We almost tend to shame people for not leaving. When in most of the other parts of the world, it's actually looked at the very opposite way. It's more faux pas to leave than to stay. And where divorced is not the automatic assumption of what should or shouldn't happen because the importance is more put on the family. It's almost seen as more shameful to break up the family just because it's happened. Now, no one likes it when it happens, just to be very, very clear. You know, we just have to kind of keep our minds open because we're not saying staying is the right thing to do. We're not saying that leaving is the right thing to do either. Also, there's a bunch of legal considerations, particularly if you're married or you have joint property or kids. I'd imagine that there's a difference between the, what the law says happens regarding infidelity versus how you emotionally probably want to enact revenge or act out your anger towards someone who was unfaithful. It depends on which state you're in, but generally speaking, like in, in New York, and adultery is obviously a cause of action for divorce, but meaning you can get divorced because of it. But most people don't use that anymore. It's difficult to prove. So most people will just go on their irretrievable breakdown of the marriage, which is basically no fault divorce. This is something that the courts are very used to. They tend not to pay a lot of attention to it unless drugs are involved or, or a lot of money or dissipation of assets and things like that. Mm. So, I mean, it's it's not necessarily something I would recommend is to like litigate those types of things in your divorce because it could just get very expensive. You might not get very much back unless, of course, there's been a lot of dissipation of assets and things of that nature. Mm. Okay, so don't go into court with your manifesto of every time this person wronged you in your mind. Unless it's really important, right? And, and your attorneys will guide you in that, in, that, in that regard. But here's my question. So we say it's okay to stay, it's okay to leave. How do you repair that? If you're thinking about staying, you're not thinking about leaving, because we know what you have to do to leave. If you're married, you get divorced. If you're not married, then you kind of move on with your life and figure everything out. But what's the process like for staying? It's hard. It's really, really tough. Very dependent on the relationship. You have to rebuild trust with yourself, not just with others. And it's a process. And again, a lot of it is kind of mourning the life that you once had. So it is possible to move on from infidelity and actually, believe it or not, to further your relationship. So this is a question I probably get the most when people come in and they're talking about needing to process infidelity is, can we actually move past this? And the answer is yes, with the big caveat of how much work are you willing to put in? Because it is a lot of work and we almost kind of look at it in phases. So the first phase is the most reactive, intense phase where the person who feels betrayed is probably going to be extremely unhappy, angry, you know, at times even emotionally a little more volatile where like one minute they might be happy with you and the next minute they might be texting you and saying, why did you do this to me? And I'm leaving. Da, da, da. So the person who quote unquote was the perpetrator of the affair, if we want to call it that, that person needs to be willing to take responsibility and to take accountability and to take a lot of heat during that time. Because what happens, I think, too often is that people try to say, well, why is this coming up? Why are we still talking about this? Because the person who had the affair wants to move on, right? But they have to remember that their partner has no idea what their process was. Their partner's new to this information about the relationship. And so that's the first phase. And then after that, you really have to go into a lot of meaning making and understanding what happened because it gets so convoluted where people want to assign blame or say, you know, was this person better than me? Do you like them more? Were you unhappy? And if the other person doesn't confirm what they're thinking, it can get really, really confusing and tricky. So if you're perfectly happy with me, then why did this happen? Because the person who felt the trade is trying to, in their mind, reconcile this dissonance between who they thought this person was, quote unquote, and who I see them to be now. And so they're reconciling all these memories and trying to make sense of how can I hold both of these things? And so it's a lot of question asking. And I think it takes both people being extremely honest with themselves and with each other. So if you're the person who also cheated, you need to be able to look at yourself and to say, what did I gain from this? Or what did happen on my end that this seemed to be, you know, either a solution or an option? Well, this seems like a lot of work. And right. I would think that a lot of people out there are thinking to themselves, well, is it really worth it to put in all this work? 
I mean, isn't it true that once a cheater, always a cheater? The short answer to that one is no. I want to honor and have some compassion for the sentiment behind that. Because the assuming if they've cheated once, they'll always cheat. That is the protective part of you that doesn't want to be hurt again because it's almost a trauma. And so it makes sense to try to rationalize that, but there's actually no evidence to support that. So to answer your question about, is it worth it? It can be, it can be because after this, people who actually do the full recovery from infidelity grow closer to their partners, but it's because you literally have to mourn that your first relationship is over. And you do have to do that. And it also, the other icky thing that people don't like to talk about and do is you have to understand. So for the person who had the affair, where are they in terms of mourning the loss of that other relationship? Are they still in it? Are they not? Okay. So you're mourning the passing of a relationship and then I I guess creating a new one. I mean, don't both people have to be on board with that? Because I would imagine that the cheater maybe doesn't think that that first relationship is, is over. And a lot of it does depend on where is the person who cheated in terms of that third person? Are they still exploring it? Are they ambivalent or have they let it go and they've, they've either mourned it? And here's the thing too, the, the partner who's been offended, the partner who feels betrayed, that is unbelievably painful, right? To know that we're trying to mend our relationship and you're mourning the loss of this other person. How am I supposed to hold space for all these things? So that is when I actually think it's important to do some individual work there because it might not always be helpful to do that in the same circle that you're trying to heal your relationship. So like when I'm working with a couple, if the partner who's having the affair is still active in the affair and has no intent to leave or is very ambivalent, I say, then why don't we focus on individual work for you to figure that out or for your partner, but we need to put couples work on hold until you're both ready and have an idea of where we think we want to take this because otherwise you're just spinning your wheels and you're hurting both people. So here's my question, right? Let's say you have two spouses or two partners and one spouse cheats because he or she feels like they're not getting emotional support from the other spouse. Maybe the spouse is critical of their job and ability to make money. And so that person meets, let's say a person that's maybe a little younger and has an affair with that person because this new person is now very self-affirming for him or her. And now we're now we're in a therapeutic situation. And obviously the other spouse feels like, well, the cheater is wrong. And now you know, you never deal with that underlying reason why the affair kind of happened. And that person is always now considered kind of the bad person and at fault. So how do you deal with that from a therapeutic point of view? Or do you deal with that in a therapeutic point of view? And then what happens kind of after to these people? So if you want to make meaning, if you really want to understand, you know, the quote unquote, why this happened or where this came from, you have to open up the possibility for your, let's call it the offending partner, for that person to explore what they learned about themselves. Because that might be something that I did this because I, I did not realize it until it happened, but I felt really inadequate in our relationship. I wasn't getting that need met. And this person admired me in a way that I haven't felt admired in years. And so it felt good. This is why it's, it's honestly a very, very difficult thing. Because if you're trying to do that in the phase one where the hurt partner is still just like wrapped up in the rage, it's not going to work because they're not going to want to hear, oh, so you, you had to go and learn how to feel adequate somewhere else? Like, you know, bye-bye, right? That's not going to work which is why you have to kind of make that distinction. But it is very, very important for the person who had the affair to be able to look at and to explore without shame, without the labeling you're a bad person, what they learned about themselves, because that will help you to move to the meaning making and actually being able to further the relationship. If you only stay in that phase one where the one person's angry and you never get to phase two, you will not be able to heal from the affair. Because the other part of that too, is that you cannot use this idea that someone cheated on you as like your ace in the hole for every fight you have. If you bring that up as though you're going back and forth and and your last card is, and you cheated on me, you will ruin your relationship because it cannot be something where you're just using this as fodder to run someone's nose in their mistakes. Now, you are allowed to process your hurt. You're allowed to talk about your triggers. But you can't do it if your partner says, hey, you didn't take out the trash. You can't be like, well, you cheated. That doesn't work. You also then have to move to that stage where you're saying, I want to understand from a loving place what you were getting there and how we can recreate this here in our relationship. So to your point, it is very, very difficult, but it's an essential piece that we're not demonizing the person who cheated because that shaming doesn't work. 
pretty intense process of mourning, recreation, and maybe like rebirth of a relationship. It seems like something that would take quite a while. You know, especially in this culture, we tend to be so instant gratification. So I can't tell you how many people have been in my office and a month after the affair, they're like, why is this still coming up? And it's like, well, because it's going to like, <laughs> you know, it's especially if it's like, well, it's, you know, you were having the affair for three years. Yeah, we're not going to fix this in a month. <laughs> but I think people forget because they want to rush through the hurt, which makes sense because it is unbelievably painful to find out that your partner had an affair. But what happens is if we rush too quickly through these stages and we don't actually give them the time that they need to really process and to sink in, then it feels like we're just kind of, you know, slapping a bandaid on something and not taking the time. So this is one of those things you almost have to think about it like a complex recipe that takes a long time to simmer. It may even be more complicated because nowadays you may not even agree that an affair took place. Exactly. And that and then what happens? That just brings us to like really the need to communicate again. You know, next week we'll talk about what happens when communication is completely broken down and the options of divorce and all that. But you know, really we've had eleven episodes and two of them we labeled communication episodes, but we really had eleven episodes on communication and the importance of communication because infidelity, what does that mean? Sex, what does that mean? What what do all these things mean and how they impact your relationship? And it seems to me that if you don't have those clear lines of communication, then you can end up in a place where there's all sorts of unintended consequences and, and, and things going on. So really, I guess at the end of the day, you know, communicate, communicate, communicate. Love Me or Leave Me is a podcast production of The Board Brand. This podcast is for informational purposes only. It does not constitute medical or legal advice and is not a substitute for professional consultation, diagnoses, or treatment. Always follow up with a licensed attorney or healthcare professional who can address your specific needs. Thanks for listening.